How are y'all doing today? Outstanding. Well, my name is Greg Washington. I'm the Dean for the Henry Samueli School of Engineering. And I want to welcome all of you to our sixth annual Ingenuity Showcase. We have a great program here for you today. And uh, the goal is to accomplish three things up front. Uh, first, you'll have a keynote address uh, from one of our nation's leaders, uh, uh, Bruce Horn from Intel. I'll give you a highlight on him in, in a few minutes, but uh, a phenomenal uh, speech. We will then recognize some of the most influential uh, individuals who will impact both of our schools. That's the Henry Samuela School of Engineering and the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences. And then lastly, and most importantly, and, and really the fun part of tonight, is that we'll showcase uh, student talent uh, from the most, arguably, the smartest and the most innovative group of students who have ever been admitted into the University of California. I can actually say that now. I've seen the transcripts. I will tell you. And I've seen their admittance scores. And I will tell you that most of us in the room would not get into UCLA. UCLA is I want to thank you all for coming. This is really a celebration of activity and technology that happens at UCI. And I'm extraordinarily happy to be able to engage with you all. <clears throat> so let's start the evening off uh, by introducing our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Bruce Horn. Uh, I was actually at the National Science Foundation about a year ago, and uh, we were, I sit on the what's called the Engineering uh, Advisory Council, Engineering Advisory Board for NSF, and we look at where science and technology will go over the next five years, and what areas should we be investing in to really prepare us for the next 20. And uh, we usually don't bring people from industry into that group. Why? Because industry doesn't think out 10, 15, 20 years. They think about the next quarter, maybe the next year, the next five years would be great. Uh, but we had this discussion about a guy at Intel who uh, was not just on the cutting edge, but setting what that edge would be. Uh, we brought him in. He gave one of the most riveting talks that I've seen on artificial intelligence and highlighted the work that not only Intel was doing, but the work that was happening in the field. And I said, look, if we get an opportunity to invite him to UCI, I wanted to be able to do that. This opportunity came up, and then I reached out to Bruce, and uh, he, he agreed to come. He is an Intel fellow and chief technology officer for the Saffron Technology Group, which is the new uh, technology group at Intel Corporation. He began his career as a member of the Learning Research Group at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Well, my, what my understanding is, he was 13 at the time, where he contributed to several implementations of the small talk virtual machine, which, those of you may know, it, eventually turned into this little fruit company that uh, we all know of today. But the group, I won't steal his thunder. He then moved off to become a software engineer at that fruit company, Apple, where he created and developed uh, the Macintosh Finder, the first personal computer based on a graphical user interface. Uh, before returning to academia, he earned his MS and PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. Following a successful defense of his dissertation, uh, Bruce co-founded Marketocracy, in 1999 as Chief Technology Officer and served six years on this Board of Directors, where he and his team had built a real-time online stock simulation system that supported 50,000 users managing over 60,000 virtual portfolios. He would later go on uh, to work for PowerSet and Microsoft as a principal research software development engineer. These days, at the Saffron Technology Group, Bruce spearheads new technologies and applications for the Saffron Technology Group's memory-based associative learning 
and reasoning systems as part of Intel's artificial intelligence uh, product platform and product offerings. He holds a BS in, in mathematical sciences from Stanford University, and we are really excited to have him here tonight. Bruce? Thanks so much for the really nice introduction. I'm not been served, but if you double click on anything, you can thank me. <laughs> so um, it's a real honor to be here at Ingenuity 2018 uh, to share a little bit about my thoughts about artificial intelligence and the future of intelligent agents. Um, you know, where did co the concept of computer augmented intelligence come from anyway? Um, how, how can we build these agents and how can we get them to do what we actually want? So they're going to be everywhere, as we already know. Um, so I'm going to be mentioning quite a few names and concepts. This is just a taste. And uh, you can do some research on your own if you want to learn more. Part of the problem here is I have 20 minutes. Uh, I think I did 45 minutes of NSF and 45 minutes of questions. So this is very impressed. So, um, so I'll st first start with an observation by uh, JCR Lickbiter. That's the first name that you should so Lick had a vision for computing that was well ahead of his time, and I'll just read this quote. In not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly, and the resulting partnership involved will think as no human brain has ever thought. Now, the word partnership really matters because we actually care about computers being something that they help us, that add to our cognitive abilities, right? that make us more powerful thinkers so we can make the world a better place. And actually, a lot of my mentors were driven by the, the need and the want and the desire and, the, and just to, the drive to make the world a better place through computing. It wasn't just you know, to sell more stuff. Um, so you know, I've been really lucky in my career to know and work with a number of these innovators. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit. And these were the people who really drove the innovations that, uh, that created personal computing and, and the evolution of the user experience. And so this is a thread that I think describes many of the ideas that we need to keep in mind as we think about building uh, intelligent systems. So how many people here know who these people are? All of them. Well, we'll start with Ivan Sutherland and the Sketchpad. Uh, you know, Sutherland, New York, Engelbart, Kay, and Josh, these are people you should know. You know, since they laid the groundwork for so much of what we actually do and use today. Every one of these people wanted to enable individuals to do much, much more through personal computing. Not, not computing you know, in the back room, not computing for the military, but computing to serve people. Um, we wanted computers to help us be more creative, to be able to simulate the world, to make better decisions, and to implement powerful concepts and expand our cognitive abilities. That's what they wanted to do. So Sketchpad, which was Ivan's PhD thesis, uh, was the first system with direct manipulation graphics. We think about that in 1960. Modeling the real world had constraints, it had objects, it had windowing, it had all sorts of things. And um, when Alan Wright asked Ivan, uh, how did you do all of this in one year? Uh, Ivan said, I didn't know it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> so Simula, Chris Newgard, another one of my mentors, um, he invented Simula because he wanted to be able to simulate the real world and, and to, he created a programming language, which is now object-oriented programming, to describe objects and the relationships with each other. And, and that was a way to conceptualize and model the real world. Um, Augment, you know, Doug Engelbart was, was driven to create Augment, a very complex and very amazing system. You can go to the, the web, look at look up Mother of All Demos, and you can see what was possible in 1968. It will blow your mind what he did. Um, he specifically wanted to augment the human intellect because he saw that the complexity and difficulty of managing the planet right, was getting much, and much more complicated and much more difficult, and that there were huge challenges to come. The only way to solve these challenges was through computing, augmenting human intellect. Um, and then Smallpox, of course, uh, the first programming environment with graphics, windows, menus, object-oriented programming, incremental computation, all sorts of great things. It was where it was kind of a playground in which graphical user interfaces, as we know them, were developed. And then the Mac, of course, Steve, he saw the 
Uh, he saw smallpox at Rock Park one day, coming to visit. I was there uh, watching him watch this happen, and I got to see him run around and throw his arms in the air saying, why are you guys not doing anything about this? And uh, so he uh, took a few of us and he did something about it. So what's the common thread with all these systems? Um, each one of these systems leveraged context. And I'm going to use that word. You have to think about what context means. Each one of them used context and shared models, how we see the world, modeling into the computer so that the computer would understand us better. So the power of context. Context is the circum are the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea in, which, in terms of which it can be fully understood. So object-oriented programming, outlining as we had augment, hypertext, graphical user interfaces, multi-touch, and intelligent systems, they all take into account context. So if you think about how you interact with computers and how computers understand kind of what you've been doing and what you're doing right now and, and interpret your interaction with the computer in the context of all of that, that's how it works. And it turns out that there's leveraging context that's been behind the scenes in every single user experience advancement since the very beginning. Even the beginning with toggle switches and command lines and overview. It's kind of fun. So what is the how would there be context on a PDP-8? Well, there are the switches on the left, which can be data or address, and then there are switches on the right or buttons that, that interpret contextually what you actually are saying on the left. So you can put in a value on the left and you push a button, pushing the right button, that's the context of how to interpret the stuff on the left. So programming punch cards, you know, obviously the, the programming language itself is contextual. The things that you say in the programming language means something based on the shared model you have with the, with the people who wrote Tyler. Um, and you know, obviously the statements that happened before and the statements that happened after provide context for what you're saying. And then things kind of got a little bit more interesting when you got to a command line interface. You could actually remember what people had already typed before and you could maybe autocomplete for them. You could actually understand what programs you were running and so only certain commands would make sense and you could autocomplete or do spell check or understand what, what uh, directory you were, if you were in and, and autocomplete the file names, for example. And so all of a sudden you have enough content to be kind of interesting to any, any people who use the command line to understand this. So this is, this is kind of the very nascent beginning of context to compute. But then it gets really exciting. So a click. What is a click? So a click is utterly defined by its context. Where do you click? What application you're in? Are you in a menu or a window region? Are you over a, a checkbox or text field? Are you holding some button down? Do you double click? Do you double click slowly or quickly? That's all the context that decides what that click actually means. It's huge, huge. The graphical user interface is all about context. And then multi-touch is the same, but you have a few more gestures. And so all of a sudden, the spatial, graphical, representational affordances, modifiers, gesture, all that stuff, all of a sudden creates the meaning for how you interact with the computer. Um, and it turns out that there, there are four types of gestures that humans make. And I'll tell you about that later at the, at the uh, reception afterwards, but that's pretty surprising too that there's only four. So, and then finally, um, when you go into intelligent agents, you know, all of a sudden you have to understand language, you have to know what you're talking about in a particular domain, you're talking about stocks, you're talking about, um, you know, baseball, or what are you talking about? And how do you talk? You have to have a dialogue model, a way that you actually can interact and take turns and understand that somebody already said something, or maybe they're interrupting the change of the subject, or whatever. Um, a wearable multimodal, same thing, but you might actually have sensors on your body, or you might know a lot more about what's going on. You might be actually seeing the person that you're interacting with. And then there's mixed and mixed multimodal, which means maybe the system has a model of what you're trying to do, your tasks, or your goals. You might have short-term goals for tomorrow. You might have long-term goals for six years from now. It needs to know those things to understand what, you should, what it should tell you and what you think it, you know, what it thinks you should do or what it should tell you to make things better for you as a intelligent agent. And then the proactive one is, you know, knows even more, knows more about the world, and it's really like a personal assistant that knows everything and, and 
basically knows your entire life and follows you around. Um, so, you know, what's next? You just get to know everything. You know, kind of sometimes on the web, you go, why did it give me that ad? How did it know that? Right? Um, that's a little bit odd. So, the context is very big. Linguistic, domain knowledge, all sorts of things. And, and we've actually made it to kind of the mixed initiative of open world where my team built some smart glasses, called the Oakley Radar Pace Glasses, that was a uh, specialized intelligent agent for running a cycling coaching. And so you would tell it what you wanted to do. I would do a half marathon in eight weeks, um, and it would it would basically be your coach. And so I'm going to give a little demo. Okay, Radar, what's my workout plan for today? We're going for 20 miles, climbing 1,800 feet. This is too easy for you. Let's push a little harder. How's my power? Your power is 321. Stop workout. Okay, Radar, what's today's run? Seven miles and climbing 900 feet. Nice job balancing your effort. Keep it up. How's my pace? It's seven minutes, 32 seconds per mile, just right. Stop workout. Great job making it to the finish. Thanks, Coach. You're welcome. So that's what we made, and it, it was quite an interesting system, and it knew a lot about you. Uh, it knew about your, you as an athlete, and knew about what you were doing in terms of your heart rate, and your pace, and your cadence, and so on, and it fit it to an, an AI model, which would basically have um, a way for the intelligent system to say something like, you're this is too easy for you, or work a little harder, or that's just right. And those are, those are really interesting things. You know, how do you know it's just right? Think about it. It's kind of deep. So the system was really complicated. We had a spoken conversational interface. Um, these are the types of phenomena that you have to understand and have to be able to do if you want to have a nice conversational interface rather than just a question answer one like we have today on almost everything. You know, uh, co-reference, fulfillment, correction, follow-ups, meta-conversation, bargain, you know, bargain meaning it's talking and then you just start talking and it stops. It says, okay, they get it, right? Or, or um, meta-conversation is, well, I don't want to talk about that or let's, I have to talk about something else now. You know, my, I have to tie my shoe. It says, okay, I'll wait, right? These are kinds of things that it has to be able to do. All these different models with the different languages, it has goals, um, the athlete model, and then the real-time multimodal fusion, speech and GPS and heart rate and all of these things had to come together to build a picture and a model in the context of what this person is doing. So it's, uh, it's pretty complicated to do something like this. It's not just a deep learning algorithm, okay? So intelligent assistants have to have different technologies and approaches to AI. And um, it's not just deep learning. So what other ways of implementing AI technologies are there? And I don't know if people have read the, the master algorithm, but Pedro Domingos explains his view, and his view is that, um, that there are these five tribes. There's the connectionist tribe, which is the deep learning tribe. Um, the symbolist tribe is the old AI of rules, rules and models and logic, right? Evolutionaries, uh, the genetic algorithms. Bayesians do probabilistic reasoning, and analogizers reason from similarity and analogy, and that's actually what Saffron is about. It's about reasoning from similar cases, and, and how do you know something similar? You have to have remembered it. So that's where memory-based reasoning comes in. So we do analogy and similarity with cognitive memory. We have a, uh, a, a what's the right term? The <laughs> schema-free semantic graph, which implements all of this memory of various sorts. So semantic memory is memory about facts of the world, for example, or about you. Uh, episodic memory is what happened when and where and what was happening around it. That's the context again. Procedural memory is how do you do things, one thing after another. And motor memory is kind of learned motor movement. <clears throat> and there's lots of other types of memory, but, but these are the kinds of things that you can model inside of Saffron. 
and we, we do that, and that you know, people, places, things, and events, situations, and outcomes, all of these are the kind of things you need to remember if you want to, to um, reason by similarity or analogy. And if you, if you remember things, um, you can learn very quickly. And you know, think about how deep learning works you know, by, by training on thousands or millions or billions of examples over long periods of time with big computers. You know, is that how we learn? I don't think so. I mean, not necessarily. So do you want to experience something once and avoid it, or do you want to try it over and over and over and over and over and train your neural network until it finally gets it, right? The thing that I'm sure everybody here can, can relate to is that an experience might be relevant to a, a similar situation decades later. Decades later, it has to be latently there for you to use it. You don't know a priori whether a piece of information is going to be useful or not. You just don't. You have to remember it. The this, this situation will come together. So we want to leverage the great advances of, of deep learning and, uh, and to use cognitive memories together exact, exactly here with deep learning in a complementary way. So we talk about it that way. We talk about complementary learning, deep learning and cognitive memory together. So the slow and stable conceptual learning must also combine with the fast instance learning, things that happen quickly. Right now, you need to remember them and learn. Um, and AI agents have to have this dual learning, the fast, fast instance learning and the slow, global, stable learning. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that is. And so the, the biggest minds, McClellan, Google DeepMind, and, and so on, they, uh, they've come to this conclusion. And so actually, uh, even the, the developers of, of backpropagation, Jeffrey Hinton says, it's time to throw everything out and start over. So I don't agree with that. I think there's some value in deep learning. but. Um, we need to leverage it in a different way. So complementary learning is machine learning, deep learning, for a train, test, and deploy on these global stable patterns like faces or landscapes or human language. These things have to be global and stable so you can recognize them again. Human language has to be stable or you guys wouldn't understand me if it changed every day. Dynamic information, situations, relationships, and outcomes, those things happen and change every day. You have to keep track of it. You have to remember it. You have to understand how they are relevant to you in the moment. So these are the kinds of things where you know, traditional and deep learning for the global stability is really important, and cognitive approach for dynamic information is how you kind of deal with the changing world. So intelligent agents are here, right? We all carry around these supercomputers in our pockets. Um, they have GPS, accelerometers, microphones, and all these sensing devices. They're recording everything. They know everything about us. Um, the teenagers all sleep with the iPhones by their heads, right? Um, it's never before been possible to amass so much data about you and about what you're doing. All this contextual information so easily. And so personal assistants, you know, like Siri and Cortana, they're not, they're not all that impressive right now. Um, but over time, they're learning from this data, and they're going to get smarter. Um, and, and they really need to know all about you. So I'm sure you've recognized signs of this. But the future of intelligent agents is knowing everything about you, really knowing you. So what does that mean? So really knowing you is like really knowing what you're doing, reading, writing, emails, text, web pages, documents, everything. The social graph, all the things that happen to you in your social world who you meet, you communicate with, or you know, collaborate with, um, where you go, what you do, what you do online, what you do offline, where you drive your car, where you walk, where, where you run, when you do your run, et cetera. And then also the world knowledge. So these are all kind of graphs of relationships that we can model. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if all of this stuff were on the web and owned by some big company, I'd feel a little bit nervous, OK? So you actually need a personal intelligent agent. So one that acts in your best interests, and this is, these are my, my, real, my, my goals. You know, no agenda other than yours and not trying to monetize you. I think we're all being monetized every minute right now. Uh, knows all about you, but only discloses your personal information on a need-to-know basis it, with a particular framework. Um, we might even have it run on device. Maybe you have a little thing, you know, the little change pocket in your pants. Well, why not put a little computer there? No one uses change anymore. And have that basically be your personal assistant there. Um, 
And if you do that, you can have privacy, security, availability, low latency, efficiency. It doesn't have to always be connected to the net. It actually can just run in your pocket. Um, efficiency is important because it turns out that uh, sending something up to the cloud with radio waves and coming back actually takes more energy than just computing on the device itself. And then finally, it acts on your behalf. It manages a trust network for you and negotiates with these other agents to serve your needs. So what does that mean about negotiation? Because there are going to be agents out in the, in the world, in the net, in cyberspace, that all want to talk to you. They want to interact with you. They want to do things with you. So how do we do that? Well, we have to negotiate with trust. Can you trust that this agent that you're talking to is representing itself honestly? You know, to deliver what's promised and to only use the information it needs. You know, what will you let the other agent know in terms of access? You know, how will the other agent use this information? These things have to be figured out beforehand. You know, and how will the transaction be valued and how will you get com uh, compensated? You know, right now we get compensated by a free Gmail account. I think I'd like to have something more than that. Um, you know, how would the other agent re reciprocate and get, give you information that you want, for example? Um, that allow, and, and can the transaction be explained? You know, clearly in the process understood. And then finally, is there transparency? Um, will the other agent disclose information that allows yours to be confident, right, that the process is fair? These are really important things about negotiating in cyberspace. And, and we need to start to set up frameworks and arrangements and agreements and maybe even laws that set these things up. Like, for example, it shouldn't be the case that an agent, intelligent agent on the web, can pretend to be a person. It should tell you, I'm a bot. Because otherwise, a lot of havoc will ensue. And I think it's really important that we, we already start to see that a little bit right now. Actually, Google gave a little demo of a thing called Google Duplex, is that right? Where uh, they had a voice call up and order a pizza or something, and it didn't disclose it was a bot. And it had all sorts of kind of human mannerisms and so on, and, and um, there's a bit of controversy about that. So um, there are a lot of ethical issues. There are a lot of uh, issues in computer science and AI that have to be dealt with. And you know, the real work of developing broadly applicable AI you know, intelligence has barely even started. So you know, if you were worried that it's already the train has left the station, it's barely left the station. right? So I'd like to end with a quote from the Stanford 100-year study on artificial intelligence. And, and I'll read this because it says, the study panel also expects a reemergence of some of the traditional forms of AI as practitioners come to realize the inevitable lim limitations of purely end-to-end -end deep learning approaches, which is almost what we're seeing, by the way, right now. It's always end-to-end -end deep learning. We encourage young researchers not to reinvent the wheel, but rather to maintain an awareness of the significant progress in many areas of AI during the first 50 years of the field and in related fields such as control theory, cognitive science, and psychology, and I'd add also ethics. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done to make AI real, to make it usable and useful for people, and to make it part of our, our world culture in a positive way. So thank you very much. Bruce, thank you for a Fascinating and thought-provoking talk. Please, please join me in another round of applause for Bruce. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Marius Papayevtimiu. I'm the dean of the Donald Brand School of Information and Computer Sciences. Next up, I want to start the second part of the program, the Ingenuity Awards. These awards are given to some of the most dedicated and influential individuals of, in our community, individuals who have had a tremendous impact on our schools. Uh, these folks not only give up their material resources, but they also give uh, something more precious, their time and their energy, helping in the formation, direction, and growth of our academic programs and initiatives. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce this year's ICS Ingenuity Award recipient, Art Hitomi. I think you're supposed to share. Okay. 
Let me tell you a few things about Art. Art is the president, CEO, and co-founder of Numescent. He's a recognized figure within the areas of application, virtualization, and streaming, and has contributed to the development of internet standards. Art is the inventor of 26 issued patents. He has led the acquisitions of other technologies and has invented and led the development of Numescent's products, including cloud paging. In the past, Art co-founded Endeavors Technologies and has held both industry and academic positions. Art is not only an ICS alum, but a Hall of Fame inductee, and as of today, as of today, a former chair of the ICS Dean's Leadership Council. Uh, Art, thank you so much for your service and your contributions. Congratulations. Please join me in the stage to accept the award. You're already on the stage. Congratulations. <laughs> Greg, you're next. <laughs> Congratulations, Art. Outstanding. Next, I am pleased to share Engineering's Award recipient, James Peterson, or as he is affectionately called, Jimmy P. <laughs> we all know Jimmy P. He's a great friend to UCI, to our school in particular, and to the local community overall. He is actually one of the true heroes in Orange County. He is the chairman and CEO of Micro Semi Corporation, Orange County's largest semiconductor company with more than $1.8 billion in annual revenue. Uh, he, the company is a global provider of uh, semiconductor solutions focused on delivering the highest level of power, reliability, security, and performance. His customers, the customers of the company include Boeing, Cisco, Hewlett Packard, uh, Huawei Technologies, IBM, Medtronic, and Samsung, uh, to name a few. Prior to Michael Semi, he held positions with Silicon Systems Inc., Rockwell Corporation, General Instruments, uh, micro, and General Instruments Microelectronics. GBP is a star supporter of education. He sits on a number of boards. I can't even name them all, including the UCI Board of Trustees. He sits on our Engineering Advisory uh, Board and the Paul Mirage School of Business Advisory Council. Uh, through, through Jim's guidance, MicroSemi has supported numerous campus-wide activities, including uh, the Susan Sam Whaley Center for Contemporary and Alternative Medicine, the UCI Diabetes Center, uh, uh, Applied Innovation Center, I think I see Richard Sudek somewhere around here, uh, our campus-wide honors program, and uh, most importantly for us, uh, the Micro Semi Presidential Chair in Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences. <clears throat> those of you who don't know Jimmy P, uh, or those of you who might know him, know that he is also known for probably some of the most amazing Super Bowl parties in Orange County. <laughs> and um, I want to congratulate you, Jimmy P, on this award. Please join me on the stage to accept it. I didn't see that. <laughs> hey, just before you start, did you invent spell check? No. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that most people are successful on the planet Earth is that spell check. <laughs> so if you find someone invented it, do me a favor. Take your hand. Right. Standing. You get a photo somewhere? Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Look in the light. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Moving right along. We are actually moving like clockwork, aren't we? So, so I'll, I'll disrupt this a little bit. Whereas, you know, uh, you can't put on an event like this without the work of some really, really dedicated people. Where, where is Kristen Hurth? Kristen, there she is up front. Please give Kristen a round of applause. Also, our advancement and communication staff and engineering and ICS, please all wave your hands. While you see Marios and myself up here, you know we didn't do this, right? There's an old saying that says, you, you see a frog at the top of a flagpole, you know he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> <clears throat> and now we get to the point of the program in which I find most exciting. Uh, I would like to bring up uh, our ICS professor of teaching, uh, Dr. Howard uh, Hadar Ziv. And Hadar is one of the instructors in ICS who's been teaching capstone classes for over a decade. And he will now begin the presentations of our students and highlight many of the student innovations that we've chosen this year. Hey, Dar. Thank you, Dean. As Dean Washington said, I serve as a, the bridge between the previous presentations and the student presentations. I'm also the bridge between the two deans. A little bit of hair, but not quite a full head of hair. <laughs> the students have worked hard to get to this point. Uh, I'm a teacher of some of the project courses on the computer science side, but we really have a very diverse set of projects represented here today. Uh, projects that participate in senior design projects, one quarter, two quarter, or sometimes three quarter projects, competitions, business competitions, design competitions, engineering competitions, game competitions, all are represented here. We have topics ranging from games, including games of chance, to parking at UCI or getting mugged at UCI. And that's not the same project, by the way. <laughs> to more serious prod topics like protecting kids and health informatics. We have many goals with our project courses. We prepare our students for the real world, usually in their senior year. Many of them work with corporate sponsors, external sponsors, UCI-based sponsored, and nonprofit organizations. And we really, really uh, love if one of our students get hired by the corporate entity that ran the project in the first place. So to start with one of those cases, I would like to invite Vin for the first presentation. My name is Vin, and I'm here to represent Team Sangrid. Sangrid is an, it's a communication platform that sends over a billion emails on a day-to-day -day basis. And a crucial part of this email delivery process is to ensure that unwanted email, emails don't end up in unsubscribers' inboxes. And to help to assist with that suppression task, our team choose to use the Bloom, the Bloom filter. And a Bloom filter is a space-efficient probabilistic um, data structure that is used to check membership of an element within a set. For our project, we created a distributed Bloom filter system that allows users to launch multiple Bloom filter instances, which are managed by a single Bloom router that, that, that directs incoming client requests to the proper Bloom filter. Another part of our project scope is to create a client simulator that lo also launches multiple instances of clients to send concurrent requests to our Bloom filter servers and collect test metrics for us to analyze the system's performance and accuracy. And here is what a standalone Bloom filter looks like. It is essentially a, an in-memory process 
that filters out some of the uh, incoming email addresses in the request payload before querying them to the our database of unsubscribed users. And here's what the workflow looks like when a client sends a request to our distributor system. The request will be routed to one of our Bloom filter nodes based on the information given in the request payload. And the system will write back a response to the client with a list of emails, email addresses that exist in our unsubscribe database. Thank you everyone for listening and please come check out our demo after the presentations. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sam Hintz, and tonight I'm really honored to be up here representing the uh, Flapping Micro Air Vehicle Project. Um, as you can see, we're a pretty big team and uh, equally good looking. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to start with a, a statement that we know that people have been building flying machines for a long time now. But what a lot of us, including myself until I joined this project, haven't taken the time to do is think back and realize that nature has been doing it a whole lot longer than we have. And the fairly predictable result of this is that there's a lot of things in flying machines that are occurring in nature, birds and little insects, that are significantly better than the ones we can build at the moment. And that's where our project starts. Um, over the past few years, we have been working to build and understand air vehicles, little flying things, that uh, mimic those systems found in nature. Um, what we're hoping to be able to gain from this is an understanding of how natural flying machines gain the efficiency, which is much higher than anything we can currently build, um, and the maneuverability and stability that they do. Uh, the first part of this is the stability. Uh, we pretty quickly discovered that the stability from most fl uh, flapping machines comes from uh, what's known as vibrational stability. You can see up there in the top right an example of vibrational stability and below how it affects a um, flapping machine. The next part of the project is the efficiency. Um, we've been working to build, design and build, an active pitching mechanism which will enable us to replicate the fairly complex um, way in which wings on small insects move, um, which allows them to get the extreme efficiency that they do. And then the third part of the project that I'd like to bring your attention to tonight um, is our quad flapper. At the moment, we're pretty sure it's the only vehicle of this type in the world. And apart from being really fun to fly, which I can assure you it is, it, uh, it enables us to see in action some of the stability and maneuverability we've been talking about. Um, we've been able to demonstrate a few really interesting concepts, like the fact that this can fly at nearly 90 degrees, which is something you simply couldn't do with a quadcopter of the same sort of design. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming, and please come see what we have to show you outside. We have the quad flapper with us, and we would love to demonstrate it for you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly, and this is my lovely and awesome team. I'm represent for the team Origami. So we are working together for 20 weeks for the company Origami. So Origami is a data integration and data analytics company that they're uh, mainly helping other companies to analyze their social media data. So within their business, they have several challenges, re challenges raising up. So firstly, whenever they communicate with their customers that do not have any technical background, the process is a little bit hard. And secondly, when they're giving, up, giving out some solutions, if their customers want, want to add in new things, the retrieval is not work as smooth as they thought. The third part is the customer service part, which we can see as like the communication between the customer and the company. It's not enough and it's not as easy as they expected. So that's why our team is in to help up help out with these challenges. So we gave out our solutions for building up a functional web app and a cooperation website. 
Let's check it out. So this is our web app. We have three main functions. The first one, it is a portfolio management system, which is, is the place for users to actually editing their personal information whenever they want. And this part is a connection management system, which is a place for users to add in or delay their social media account whenever they need it. And this part is the dashboard part, which is a place for users to read the data and see the actually data visualization. For the cooperation website, we start with a really big and designed hello picture, which is useful for all the people who click into the cooperation website to see what this company do. And then we tell all the people who click in like what integrations we mainly serve and what the price plan we offer and how to get in touch with us. So this is pretty much our product. Thank you for listening and please visit us to see a live demo. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. My name is Ethan Lieberman. I'm a software and design engineer with Soroto Bioprinters, and I'm here tonight with Mikkel Davis, our wonderful team lead, Sydney Minar, our head of marketing, who is also heavily involved in the design process, Alex Schmidt, our mechanical engineer, and Derek Lublin, our electrical engineer. Now, developing a new drug is extremely expensive, with preclinical trials alone costing up to a billion dollars. And much of this money is being spent on testing the drug against various cell cultures in order to find out exactly what it's good for. 3D Cell cultures are especially desirable because the cells in the 3D culture more closely mimic their function in the body than those laying flat in a 2D dish. Unfortunately, 3D cell cultures are extremely difficult to reproduce consistently and with a high quality. And utilizing 3D printing technology, we at Soroto hope to achieve both. Oh yeah, so in order for our cell cultures to be effective for pharmaceutical screening, they need to be printed with an extremely high both volumetric and linear resolution. And um, they decide the, the device also needs to be cheap so that any small pharmaceutical company can implement our device into their workflow. In addition, to generate multiple disease models, the device needs to be able to print multiple materials and cell lines and be able to e be easily customized so that it can accommodate a variety of new experimental conditions. Uh, we do have an actual prototype, which you can see a model of right here, as well as a 3D printed gradient of Jello which uh, demonstrates the, both the volumetric and linear resolution of our printer. We will be running live demos at our table um, with uh, an interactive component, so please feel free to come by and check us out. Thank you so much. Hey, hello, everyone. My name is Nathan, and I'll be representing Team ID and our project, the IoT Parking Monitor System. Our project is sponsored by Professor Mark Bachman of Integra Devices and IRIS. So tonight, you all probably found parking here fairly easy. But if you've been on campus and have parked in any of the parking structures, um, you've, you'll find that it's extremely difficult to find parking, especially from the time of 10 AM to 3 PM. Um, I myself, as well as many other students, have gone from the first floor all the way to the, the top of the sixth floor and still never found parking. Uh, so that's where this project kind of comes from. So our system wants to provide live updates on the status of parking spots in parking structures. Uh, we basically want users to be able to see parking spots uh, in real time so that they can make informed decisions. Um, and then ultimately, it is an IoT uh, system, so we want businesses to be able to analyze and understand their parking trends. So our system is comprised of three main components, an Android device, uh, which we're using as an edge device sensor. Uh, we're gonna use the, we, we are using the camera to retrieve data on whether a car is parked in a parking spot or not using pixel change detection. And that data will be sent to a cloud server where it is stored. Then the web client dashboard will be able to retrieve that data and update its dashboard for users to see. So thank you so much for having us here and we hope to see you guys at our booth. Hello everyone, I'm Nicholas Talebi and I'm going to be presenting to you Empower 2.0, which is part of the Rehab Robotics Lab for, um, from Dave, Dr. David Rankinsmeyer. What is it? It is a levered power wheelchair for stroke patients or muscular dystrophy patients. What we do is, from the picture on the left, you see that this is a push rim 
type of wheelchair. And what we do is we add mechanical levers um, using pipes, aluminum pipes that were manufactured and machined. And we use these and we use bike cables for the propulsion and braking. Um, the reasons for this is we want low income because a lot of these, a lot of wheelchairs, electric or um, other types of wheelchairs can be expensive. And so we want for low income people. And it provides mobility, rehabilitation, and physical therapy for these patients. On the levers, we have adjustable armrests. These adjustable armrests allow for a range of different types of heights of patients. And we did a, a, a little study on campus and found, and we did a range of about 30 to 35 students, an adjustable height that would allow for different patients for arm height for, to, from the base of the wheelchair, the seat of the wheelchair, to the elbow height. We found that was about 9.75 inches, and so we have about three different adjustments so that they can ride comfortably. Another part of this wheelchair is we've been designing a, what is called a yoke clutch, and this is a one-handed operation of the wheelchair, because a lot of these patients are asymmetrical in their muscular uh, function in their arms, and so we want them to be able to ride in a straight line, and so what this does is it allows them to hold the clutch on one handle and move both wheels at the same time. This was our first iteration, and our second iteration is currently being uh, developed and assembled today. And what this is is a more uh, robust and more um, uh, uh, specific system to our wheelchair, which allows for more tight functioning in our uh, bright cables and brakes and allows for a uh, more precise fitment in our uh, design. Uh, so thank you, and uh, please come see us at our booth. Hello everyone, my name is Christopher and I'm here representing Sky Farm, which is a student project developed in two quarters for our CGS program. So what is Sky Farm? Sky Farm is a mobile puzzle game where you use time to manipulate the environment. Um, what made our game stand out from regular other, other mobile games is like it doesn't play into a mobile model. It pretty much respects the player's integrity to learn mechanics without pretty much tutorials or some sort of some sort of learning mechanisms and things like that. We have a mix of mechanics, um, textless gameplay, 50 levels, and infinite possibilities of puzzles. So the way our team was organized is we were a self-organized team using agile process models, and pretty much what that meant is every decision or game design decision was made with team iteration, and everyone on the team had weekly sprint responsibilities. So for our initial um, push, we pretty much focused on fast prototyping, making easy creation tools for our developers to pretty much push the project forward as much as we could, or even at the halfway point, we could already consider to have a finished prototype. Um, and then for the halfway point, we just wanted to focus on the aesthetics, making it look nice, um, making it focusing on user experience with continuous testing. And pretty much here's our workflow chart, which you can see we had a big push in the beginning and big push to the end to have a complete um, project, yeah. <laughs> and um, at the end of the project, we actually won an IEEE Game SIG Award, which is pretty much a competition showcasing some of the best projects in the Southern California area. Um, um, and pretty much from that, we've actually applied to grants. Um, we're looking forward to one next week that we want to hear a response from. It's available on itch.io, um, but we are looking on porting for iOS and Android markets. Um, and we're also just submitted our application for NDK 2018. And um, we do have demos set up at our booth, so we'd invite you to come, and thank you for having us here. Hello, everyone. My name is Evelyn Vasquez, and I'm representing my team, Spiro. So the purpose of our project is to basically target low patient adherence to traditional forms of respiratory therapy. If anyone has ever been in a hospital or has known someone who has, very often if they are prescribed respiratory therapy, they are prescribed this device right here. It's called an incentive spirometer. Now the goal of this device is relatively simple. The patient is trained on it once and they're asked to breathe through the tube to produce enough force to lift up the lever. But for anyone who's actually trying to use this device, it's kind of like asking someone who just ran a marathon to breathe through a straw. It's frustrating, it's hard, and it's very painful. So no wonder patients don't want to do it. In a national survey, 86% of respiratory therapists agreed that there is a problem with adherence. The top main reasons that they 
cited were that the patient would either forget to use this parameter, it wasn't used effectively, or it wasn't used often enough to actually make a difference in their health care. So when we talked to a lot more respiratory therapists more about this issue, they suggested that the main reason is that there's no accountability. There's no way to actually keep track of their patients actually using the device without physically being in the room with them at all times, which is kind of hard to do. So our solution is this game-based respiratory therapy device. Now what this device does is that it makes their therapy into a game. By wearing a wearable stress sensor on their diaphragm, it monitors their deep breathing exercises. And because it's a game, they're now incentivized to actually continue on with their exercises while giving the respiratory therapist a quantifiable measurement that they're actually keeping track. So with this device, we hope to help the respiratory therapist and their patients breathe easy. And if you'd like to play, please join us outside. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Amy Sheehy and I'm here representing Identify Tech, which was sponsored by Identify Bio. Do you feel in control of your healthcare? Having to constantly go in to deal with the mountain of paperwork, having to face another document you forgot, another insurance card, a signature here, a signature there, unable to get in direct contact with your own physician, being able to try to have that connection and you're not able to. And that's if you're able to get through all the hoops and loops of trying to get an appointment itself, there's no easy way. But it's time for that to change. It's time to take control of your healthcare. With Identify Bio, we have developed an application to increase patient engagement and to bring that control to you. No more paperwork, no more hassle of trying to set up all those appointments, forgetting a document here and there, storing it easily up in a cloud, to be able to develop that personal relationship with your physician, as well as an easy and simple system for you to be able to request appointments whenever you need them. These are some slides from our actual application. You can see on our leftmost slide an easy stylistic homepage to help remind patients of when their next appointment's going to be. Easy for them to remember, engaging them and helping them to remember so that way they don't constantly forget it or they don't if they remember whether or not they actually got one. The next one you can see our easy appointment scheduling where you're able to select what day you you want your appointment as well as limiting that, put in a request and it will update immediately on your homepage. Next, you see our private messaging system where you can message your doctor, counselor, nurse, wherever you need. This messaging system was built by scratch and as well allows complete privatization and allowing the doctors and the patient to have full control over their own messaging. Lastly, you see our profile screen, which allows you to control your own account, upload a signature for further use, as well as upload any important documents so they are stored in the cloud and you can access them at any time. Thank you very much for your time. Please come by our booth so we can demonstrate for you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Onali Gunasekara and today I will be talking about my team's product called Watchdog. So my friends and I stay pretty late on campus studying, we're all engineering students. When we walk back home, we usually feel unsafe, even with the current blue light um, emergency phone system located on campus. There are two reasons for this. The first reason is because the blue light phones are scattered across campus, making it hard to locate. The second reason is even if we do find one and use it, it would take about 20 minutes for the police to come to the scene. The blue light phones were made before cell phones were popular, and they're very much outdated because probably each one of us today has an iPhone in our hand. So as a replacement to this system, we propose our solution Watchdog, an autonomous drone security system. Um, it has all the same functionalities as the current blue light system, except that it is dynamic, so it comes to the user. So how does our, phone, uh, our drone work? So first, if you feel unsafe or you need help, you open our app, you click the SOS button. This sends your current GPS location to the nearest quadcopter station um, in your sector. 
This quadcopter station has two purposes. It activates the drone, which performs dynamic waypoint navigation to reach the user. So even if the user decides to move around and not stay in one location, it will track the user. It also has a solar panel to charge the drone, so it's self-sufficient. Um, our drone also takes, has a camera, so it takes video recording of the situations and transmits it to Dropbox. Once it's on Dropbox, the police can access um, the video footage. So there are many advantages to Watchdog compared to the current blue light system. Not only is it cheaper, faster, and safer, it offers a big change, which is it offers data, which the current blue light system cannot offer. It offers time-sensitive information that the police may need in an emergency situation, such as a school shooting. There are many applications for Watchdog. It's not limited to universities. It goes also for parking lots um, and cargo lots. It can be used in communities or trails to scare away wildlife, like a coyote, which Irvine has a lot of. Um, <laughs> and it could be implemented in schools. References. So we see a lot of potential in improving the current school um, security system nationwide. We won Nudesic's uh, Best Big Data Hack at USC's um, Athena Hackathon earlier this year. We also hope you see the potential in our product too, and you come visit us at our booth for some of our demos. So thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Kay, and I will present CrewView. We hope this could be a new production pipeline for scenic design practices. So we learned the ideas from a Broadway producer. Uh, set designers, they start designing sets in the software, but they have to build small physical models like this. And this alone cost, could cost $10,000 to $50,000 for a big show like one in Broadway. Now with CrewView, we will make this cost zero by utilizing augmented and virtual reality. So it works on smartphone just like this and allows you to work around your model. We also made a node feature for ease of collaboration. For example, if you open the node called red column, you will actually see the red column in the background in front of you. This allows everybody to talk on the same topic. They know what object that the node is referring to. CrewView is course platform. We also have a VR version for immersion and advanced design. In VR, you can go where you have never gone before. And as you think, you spawn objects, move and manipulate them. You can change color, texture, and lighting. You can also play in the sandbox with tutorials. We believe by integrating AR, VR technology with existing design process, we are creating a new way to visualize, communicate, and collaborate for scenic design practices and for more application fields. Come and see our demo at the booth. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Brant Booker, um, and I'm the team lead for Counterattack. And we're a two-person group who's been uh, working for the last year, actually a little over a year, like 14 months, um, to develop a cloud-based service for casinos to use for bulk processing for all the data of casino games. And our one application that we've developed from that is catching card counters. Um, so the current system that we've developed has a very simple, secure, uses industry standard encryption, um, API, which is run through a web app. Um, so you don't need any programming knowledge to be able to use it. It requires no initial setup. I could set it up in my kitchen in five minutes if I wanted to host a blackjack night. Um, and it's currently available. It's totally free to use currently. Um, and if casinos, for example, wanted higher throughput, they could use it as a monthly subscription. It's nice because they can begin using it for free. They don't need to purchase any hardware or anything. But if they'd like to stop at any point, they're no worse for it. They just stop using it. Um, and so currently it's set up as a back end and a front end. We've built the whole thing from the ground up using a series of very helpful libraries. Um, but a lot of the things that we're detecting, such as counting stacks of chips from arbitrary angles and detecting overlapping cards on a table that are moving very quickly, we've had to build 
from the ground up. Um, we've done it all ourselves. So this is definitely the biggest project that either of us has ever worked on before, but it's really rewarding and it's a really, really cool project. Um, moving forward, what we hope to do is apply these tools that we've developed to detect cards, to detect chips, to a lot of other games that have cards and chips. And we can actually expand that so that instead of just detecting uh, card counting and other advantage play in real time, we can detect things like illegal cheating or counterfeit cards, counterfeit chips, that sort of thing. Um, we even have the idea to start using facial recognition to not only track people as they move around the casino, but also to um, store the data as people come back over time, start building a profile, and uh, have all that data available to the casino owners if they'd like to use it. Um, so if you'd like to see this, or if you, any, or if you have any questions, uh, you can come. We're actually going to be dealing live games of blackjack, and you can see how good you are at counting cards in real time. Yeah, thank you. Hi, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Atrina Pibdiani. I am a part of Team Alpha Beta Python, and this is the Team Kids Digital Challenge. So just to start off, currently in the US, there's about 25% of youth. And right now, studies have shown that about one out of every four of them often feel like they are disconnected or devalued within their communities. And this really poses a big issue for us because kids are ultimately our future. So this is where Team Kids comes in. Team Kids is a nonprofit organization that works with both schools and law enforcement agencies who put together week-long events in order to encourage kids to get more involved within their community. So our group wants to really focus on using this type of thing to, sorry, <laughs> slow down. Okay, so <laughs> we want to make it available, we want Team Kids to become more available to a wider audience, so we put together we started developing a mobile application. So what this app does, it aims to encourage kids along with their parents to come through and start completing certain challenges within their community. So after completing each of these challenges, they will be able to go onto the application and earn badges and also level up in different categories similar to a game like fashion. And in addition to creating this web portal, we've also, this mobile application, we've also developed a web portal in which the Team Kids admin will be able to go through and update any necessary information within the application. So what we wanted to do was basically create something that will promote kids to get out there and get involved in their community, because ultimately with Team Kids, we're trying to empower today's kids to become tomorrow's heroes. Thank you. These were great presentations. Let's give uh, another round of applause to our students. So these student projects are offered throughout the year and are made possible with uh, the support of our corporate partners and, of course, the hard work of our students. Uh, if you or your company have a design challenge or would like to get involved with our students and our faculty, please let us know. We've reached the conclusion of these presentations. Thank you all for coming. Please join us at the reception and demos on the patio. Thank you.